Thank you so much, Mdu, and uh, welcome to, to everyone. People are still joining, but uh, I would just wanted to say a, a warm welcome uh, for tonight, our first partnership in this bi-monthly um, series with artists, with writers, uh, with poets from around the world. And this is thanks to my good friend and colleague, Indra Vuso, the director of the Silk Foundation. Um, we are very, very fortunate to have this partnership for the last two years, and uh, we, we're looking very much forward to the year ahead. It is wonderful to see friends from South Africa, friends from around the world, uh, Holocaust survivors, descendants of Holocaust survivors. And what I want to do is to dedicate today's uh, uh, today's webinar to our dear, dear Holocaust survivor, Vic Veronica Phillips, who passed away yesterday. Uh, to those of you that knew Veronica, you knew that she was from Budapest, and I see Margareta uh, is joining us from Budapest and actually knew Veronica uh, before. Um, Veronica was 94 years old when she passed away. She survived the ghetto, the international ghetto in Budapest. Uh, Karl Lutz, the, the uh, Swiss diplomat, tried to save her life, but she was picked up by the Nazis and sent to um, three concentration camps, to Ravensbrück, Penig, and one subcamp of Penig, and then um, survived the death march before uh, liberation. Her father was murdered, but her mother and brother survived. And Veronica moved to South Africa later, was a geneticist, biologist, and lectured at Wits University, and uh, was an amazing, amazing, courageous, uh, courageous, wise, intelligent, loving, funny woman that shared her testimony with many, many groups in the last 10 years. She only started to speak very late in life. But in the last 10 years, she shared it and uh, felt a need for the young generation to hear uh, from a survivor, and that's what she did. Sadly, Veronica did not have children. Uh, she always shared that she had eight miscarriages, so she could not have children. Uh, her funeral was yesterday. Uh, her niece, Janice Leibovitz, and her children were Veronica's family, and we were her family. We deeply mourn her loss and we are all heartbroken by her death. So uh, Enrique, I hope that you do not mind that I actually dedicate your, your session with us for the blessed memory of uh, Veronica Phillips. Of course, it is also Purim. So for the Jew, Jewish community that is sharing uh, tonight with us, with Enrique, and with Indra, I wish you a very happy holiday of Purim. With that, I would like to give the floor to my colleague and friend, Indra Wusso, to start the proceeding. Indra, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Tali. Such a terrible loss. And to start then with something else after this is quite hard. Um, but Enrique, I'm so happy that at least I see you and I know where you are in Valparaiso. I know your place and it's quite exciting. Um, actually, welcome everyone to our new series, Voices of Belonging and Resistance. And this is a new bi-monthly series, as Tali already said, that we do with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And we are very, very happy about this collaboration. And Enrique is the first writer with whom we actually talk about identity, family identities, identity issues, where we are born, where we go to, is it how do we can decide where we want to belong to, is it something static, is this dynamic, how does it change through writing, through reflection, through meeting people socially, so all these we will discuss, and Enrique is the first one. So welcome. <laughs> it feels like as we sit next to each other, but we don't, it's a far end of the world. So how is it in Chile right now? 
Well, we are, um, good evening to everybody. Thanks, Tali, for the introduction. Thanks to everybody who's present today. Thanks a lot, Indra, for this invitation. For us, I was telling Indra before that it's amazing to have the opportunity to be in touch in a conversation again throughout a topic that the SILT Foundation and herself have been present all the time. We will tell you a bit of this process. Now in Chile, we are living, well, it's always a turmoil, but now it's a, a bigger one because of the pa pandemic as everybody else is having it around the world, but also with the social issues, the social uh, movements that have been um, taking the country towards a new constitution. So there's a lot of things going on around here that perhaps we'll have the chance to talk about too. I'm very happy to be here sharing with you all. So let's go. Yeah, and do you still have the mayor who is the socialist mayor in Valparaiso who tried yeah, to do everything different in this capitalist? <laughs> <laughs> we, still, we still have this uh, kind of experimental city going on. There's a new election on, in April 11th, so he's still our major at, at least until April. We'll see what happens next. We have a huge election that includes all the candidates for the new constitution, the candidates for mayor, for the city council, for governor. It's like half the, half the politicians will renew or, or repeat. On, April. Yeah, so, but now let's go first in Medias Race and talk about what we should talk about, the novel about your grandmother. Um, maybe first of all, to quickly also introduce Enrique. He's born in 1982 in Santiago de Chile. Um, and he was, before he became a poet and a writer, he was a, he was a lawyer and worked actually in the Congress, um, in Chilean Congress. He was an editor and he is, as Ndu said just now, he uh, published some books of poetry, one novel already, and was a very, or is still, I guess, a very important editor for contemporary fiction and poetry in Chile and a fabulous, fabulous translator. Um, from Emily Dickinson and Philip Larkin to name just a few. So yeah, are you still translating that much? Yes, I am, I am. I am translating new stuff. Uh, there's a new chapbook from Susan Howe that is appearing soon. And funny enough, with my basic German, I'm doing some collaborations in translation, no? Uh, putting into Spanish forms, some translations done by, by German authors, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you lived in Cologne for some time right now. Yes. So for, yeah, for, longer, than, for longer than I wanted because of the, of the, <laughs> of the coronavirus. No, I couldn't come back until late September. Yeah. And how? when was your son born? That was also not a year ago. In April. I have a pandemia old son. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but interestingly enough, we just when we talked about this event with Enrique, we found out that we've been knowing each other for five years now, and it actually that was the start of the novel about your grandmother. Maybe we quickly look into the starting of, of this novel. When did you realize this is something I want to write about, um, or there is something, some story about my grandmother that needs to be told? Well, um, perhaps uh, I will start giving a bit of a context to the audience. I, I'm Chilean. I was born and raised in Chile as my father did. And he was born from a German father and a Polish uh, mother. Um, they came to Chile from the Second World War. That was everything I knew about. And of course, I was always intrigued by that story, especially because I knew, I knew late, lately, you know, only when I was 20 years old, and by chance, I got to know that my grandfather had committed suicide here in Chile when my father was very young. Okay, so, can I quickly interrupt you here? Because that's actually the, where we should uh, show the video, the first video we... I know, I know. I, 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 I thought that would be the, the thing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can put the video and we'll see how we put ourselves again into this good mood after the video. Yeah. Um, so which one, the first one? Yeah. The like one the, Solta. Uh, Solta. Yes. Yes. Okay. It has a uh, English and German subtitles. Thank you. 
ustedes la olvidaron en el pasar de Presidente Rasuris 2901. Also, uh, that poem was written in 2002. I was uh, 20 years old. And um, when, um, well, this is funny because now I'm seeing myself in the, in the image and I got distracted, sorry. So at the, how can I make it to see Indra again? <laughs> well, um, that um, a poem was written to, uh, when I was 20 years old in 2002. I, very much immediately as, as I knew uh, the secret, now this family secret of my father's grandfather's death. So in a sense that poem, and then in two, around 2006, when I started getting to know a bit more about my grandmother who was alive and um, who was basically not that much present during our infancy, um, we, um, I wrote another poem about, about her in that case that is called The Polish Woman that we will share in a while. So I pretty much think that out of those poems and out of other poems that I wrote for my first book, Atalas Naves from 2003, that I've been at least 20 years writing about this, no? I mean, looking, searching for things about my own identity that I didn't know. My father was an only son. Um, who was part of, a, of strong political movements, left-wing movements, uh, communist movements in Chile in the 60s and 70s. So with the dictatorship, he basically um, uh, made all that uh, participation disappear too. So um, he's an, uh, an engineer himself. He's a very solitary man, very nice father, not, not a single problem with him. What I mean to say is that he pretty much decided not to have any past, not a political past from his youth, not a, a identity past from the German or Polish that he was taught when, I, when he was a kid. He knew both languages. He uh, had a, a German family. He even went to Poland for the first time in the 2000s with my grandmother. I was raised totally Chilean, what is a um, very common situation in my country and I guess in South Africa too. But I guess there is a difference that here is my is majority, no? So you cannot tell in the streets, you cannot tell by a sing, single first glance if somebody descends from an immigrant or not, let's say. So for us, it's not a topic. It's very normal to have a German last name as I have uh, without meaning anything on identity, no? So that's very fluent. And of course, I've had a, a lot of interest since the very beginning for other cultures, and we can talk about that uh, too. So once I started getting old to try to make a short answer to this beginning, uh, some people started telling me about, asking me about this grandmother, no? Like, so you have this Polish grandmother who came from the Second World War and um, asking me like personal things about her. And, and I started becoming more and more interested. And I can tell, and in the novel she appears, an ex-girlfriend, a former girlfriend who, told me like after I wrote my first novel that although it was fiction it had a bit to do with what happened to us 
in, in real life. She told me, why don't you stop writing about me and you start writing about your grandmother who's a real character who, and by the way, you can start understanding who you are, where you come from. And that was pretty much the beginning. I, many years before I did present the project with the first uh, pages I wrote, uh, to the Chilean Culture Council in 2015. Then in 2016, I met Indra from the Seed Foundation. And then it's more or less the story Indra knows a bit and we can share furthermore today. But how is it you, so suddenly your grandmother was there for you. And did you go to her and said suddenly, oh, you know, there is something about you I never ask, I would love to know, or would you mind sharing your story so that I can write a book? Or how was this moment? Well, it happened uh, in that uh, I knew I had to write this. In fact, the moment I'm telling you about, like this very moment in which this girlfriend told me, I remember it was still a few years before I was thinking about, okay, I should do it one day. I'm doing, I was writing, publishing other poetry books, translation stuff. So one day I'm gonna do this research. And I remember um, on, um, it was on the Christmas 2014 that I recorded her, that I put like my phone under the table without telling anybody. And I just recorded our conversation in the Christmas uh, Eve because I felt there was something, as a writer, I'm obviously very interested in the ways of saying, and, I, and she always spoke, probably some of you with your own families have this experience in South Africa, that she always spoke with the Polish uh, syntax. So for instance, she didn't use the articles that in Spanish are very important because they determine the gender, for example. So she would speak in the Polish syntax order, you know, with the Spanish words. So she had a very specific way of saying things that really intrigued me. So I started recording that. And after a while, um, oh, sorry, I'm making a mistake there. No, some, something happened before. This is very important, sorry. And this events helped me put my mind in order again about the book that is finished. The first thing was that my grandmother had this, um, was a hoarder, no? Somebody was this, disease of like um, keeping things, no? not being able to throw things away. And, um, and because of that, in a moment, it was really an issue for the neighbors. She lived in a middle-class neighborhood with people, where people made a lot of effort to put their houses well together. And she was living among a lot of garbage, basically, um, in perfect mental conditions. No? She would do her life independently, but still, Inside her house, she would have this situation with a lot of dogs, cats, birds, things that I would never talk about if they weren't inside the novel. So they would be public anyhow in, 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 a, in two months. So with that, I, um, this curiosity augmented. I really was worried about her. And when I started noticing, when we took her to a health, uh, to a, a retirement house because of this situation, when I started noticing that she started forgetting things and, not, and while she was talking about something, she would just forget and go to something else, just as, as it happens to me, but in her case was <laughs> because, because of her illness, I felt I was against time. So I was really worried. I, I just started making it faster. And then from the moment I started recording her every month and going to and asking her about her past uh, until she totally forgot me and, and stopped recognizing even her own son, it was only two years, a span of two years. So when that happened, that was obviously very sad for everybody. For me, I must admit it came with a bit of satisfaction of us feeling, okay, I did it just on time, you know? Like almost everybody in the world, when we pass away, uh, pass away, we are just forgotten apart from the people who loved us, no? And in her case, I managed with the information she gave me that was very, uh, very little, I could get to certain documents and to make these scripts and this uh, research. And then I came back to her many times with new information. And from that position of um, emotional information, she would uh, get uh, further, further, in, uh, further in her own uh, memories. So it was 
a weird process in a sense i was making her I, I was giving her the materials for her to remember so i would come with a name let's say from a boyfriend from the polish when when she was living in novitburg um, matsoyevsky in a small town near varsa where she was raised and out of the name, she would tell me a street or she would tell me about a school and then from the school I would get something else and stuff. So it was um, a very touching experience um, and I'm, I can't um, hide that I'm proud that I gave her a bit of that happy memories at the end. And I was, and I tried to be decent enough not to enter too much in the more traumatic parts because by the way, those traumatic parts had more documents. I could I could put more things together by knowing where she was at, in what date during the Second World War or between wars. No, she was born in 1924, and um, the Germans also kept track from things before the before the war, so I could get things from my from the family from my grandfather. But anyhow, everything I could get 200 years before was only in in Polish territory. So recently, only with this last edition, with the, working with the editor hand by hand, I came to the decision to divide the novel in four parts that are basically a trip to the origin. This is something Indra doesn't know because it was after the work at Silk Foundation that I start with the, with the information that goes from 2008 to 2013, so from the moment the police makes the claim on this abandoned woman, makes the claim to somebody named Enrique Winter that it's not me, but my father, and all the way through when she doesn't uh, recognize us anymore. So it's these six years. And then the next, the second part goes um, from when she comes to Chile until that very moment. And then the third part goes from when she was born until when she comes to Chile. And the fourth is before she was even born with all the story from the beginning of the 19th century um, until, until um, the era when she was born, but based on my grandfather's family. So I'm pretty much um, making a Ukraine in a sense, but also putting into meaning, into sense, into discussion, uh, this fluidity of identities of Germans, uh, um, uh, of these four uh, worlds that shared the Polish uh, territory around the city of Lodz and the um, um, neighboring fields, no? the countryside, that is the Orthodox um, Russian, the, the Jewish community, the Polish Catholics and the German Protestants, Lutheran, no? So, so well, it's obviously a fascinating, a fascinating story of inclusion and of course of love and hate network. I mean, the interesting thing you say four words, four parts. I mean, there is so much, they are so much time, so many different stories. I mean, a Europe that your family left behind and as you said, assimilated into the Chilean society. So what it's interesting for me is when you chose what to write in this novel, you have to surely also deal with the void, with the silence, with what is not there in which what you can't find out. How do you deal dealt with all these things that you didn't discover or that well, your grandmother hid or couldn't say after a while? Well, it's that, that topic in particular, I knew your questions would be great from the very beginning because that topic in particular has been growing exponentially. And right now it has taken away, it has taken away even the title of the novel. Right now the novel will appear in Chile with the title Sobre Nosotros Callaremos, that in English will be translated something like about ourselves, we will keep quiet. We will keep quiet about ourselves, something like that. Um, it's a quote from Francis Bacon. Um, funny enough, he wrote it in, in, not in English, his mother tongue, but in Latin, the ipsis, the novice ipsis solemus, no? uh, about ourselves, uh, we will keep silent. Um, and it's the first, the epi, uh, I don't know, epigraph is the word in English, the word that, the foreword that Kant decided for his uh, main work for um, critica, uh, 
well, it doesn't matter the title, you will know the title in English, I know it in Spanish, Critica de la Razón Pura. The thing is, uh, both uh, Bacon writes it and, and Kant quotes it, because the idea in both is that for a piece of work to be really relevant, one has to keep silent about oneself. So they decided in, all, in huge rationality to keep all the subjectivity away. And incredibly enough, that is exactly the same decision that my father made and my grandmother made. So even when I was asking them about the, mo the most precious and lovely things of their lives, they would always, it, they will, it will never pass, about, pass through themselves. It will always be like, official information, like rational information, like um, mathematical puzzle. No? I will just give you a, a small example. My grandfather, sorry, my father himself was the one who, go, who had the lock of the University of Chile. He was the guy who put the key through the lock when he had to go away the day of the military coup. And I was telling my father, but can you see this? I mean, there's the University of Chile, the public education, and you're the one who locks it and just leaves when the militars are leaving. And he was like, yeah, um, what's, what's about it? You know what, I have the key, I have the lock. Now he cannot see like the literary meaning of it, you know, like the huge subjectivity or, or, the, or this small beings that all of us are, that are sometimes in the midst of a huge history, you know, my, my grandmother in the, in the resistance, no, in the in the resistance in Warsaw against the invasion, no? etc. So it, this became finally the title of the novel. Uh, the the, for, the the phrase I put at the beginning from Sophocles has to do with that, with time. Time, uh, according to Ajax, his um, um, theater play, time uh, brings all things back to the light. But, after, but afterwards, it conceals them again. Like in a, in a sense, time lets you understand something that was hidden. That is basically what I'm doing with this novel. But at the same time, it, don't, it only shows you things for a while, no? And then everything goes back to this obscu total obscurity. So the novel is a huge effort to be in that moment of, of showing what was hidden. And um, I was very concerned of not doing, with not doing the typical postmodern uh, novel uh, in which the character is the author himself or herself uh, with the impossibility of getting to, towards the truth. This was very necessary in the, at a moment for, for literary history because there was like um, an ethical problem with making a novel as though the characters, the real characters were not suffering what is being told, no? Like in Cold Blood from Truman Capote, for example. So I really tried hard to make a novel, but keeping as much as I could uh, close to, to real truth to documents. But what I found out in the process was that, for example, if I knew the address of where my grandma, grandmother lived, and I knew she was in front of the train station and I knew she ran behind the train when the train passed and that the school was on the other side and then she went to a, to a Catholic school. And if I get to all that information, well, how do I put it into writing? When I start putting it into writing, it immediately becomes fiction. I see her running and I put how her cheeks look and how the air presses her face and everything starts becoming fiction immediately. So it's very, very difficult to tell when I'm inventing and when I'm not. And with this new order that goes from this very last moments when I was present to moments when I wasn't, it's also like a trip from truth, from knowledge towards fiction and, and obscurity and silence. You can tell that the novel also travels from, from speech to silence. And now I'm just thinking right now that it's very literal in that because my grandmother there is very present in her speech. I, trans I, I transcribe directly how she spoke. And I guess she speaks, I mean, it's so vivid to read how she speaks that somehow I had to make an effort as a writer to offer a prose that could compete with the liveliness of these uh, confessions. No? Um, and on the other side, 
what I did was to uh, assume or to conclude things out of uh, several um, documents and information that make it very probable that things went in a certain way instead of assuming that I cannot know. So, so what could be a good example of this? Okay, that um, I know when my great grandparents died because I have the documents of their death and the, and the city. And for example, uh, and I know that my grandmother's mother, we don't have the, the death date, but I know that it has to be in between 1941 and 1942. I know where everybody was at that time. So very, very probably she was in the very same house in Novitburg and she was a victim of, uh, of the war, naturally. But with other characters, according to where they were or the illness they had, of course, the, the decisions are others. And um, well, I guess the, the general idea is there. Of course, we can get into more specific things if you want. I mean, the interesting thing is actually, because as you said, the pain and what is there, how can you actually put it into a novel and fill the silence in a way that it makes sense and is not, yeah, and it's still a truth that goes beyond this, the single life. Because obviously there are, there are experiences that were general in the time of the war. So you can think what might have happened and how, how in your work, is it a novel, is it a memoir? How, what's, what's the role of your grandmother in there? Is this really very specifically her life or do you also use her as an example of what happened in that time and, and, and how the time were to describe the time she was living in? Yeah, you're, you're touching something that is very, very risky for, for writers, for prose writers, I guess. That is, one has to make a huge effort in the art uh, um, product, let's say, not to assume that a human being represents something in general, no? Because we don't represent anything. I mean, we, we are ourselves and, and, and in our fact, and we should try not to use others for that. That's uh, for sure. But you're right. Obviously, when I tell her story, I'm telling, I'm very conscious that it's a story that we share, many of us share, you yourself with your own background or many of the people here in the audience, but also my own country. Like most of us are a mix of, of a, a European immigrants and native um, inhabitants of this, of this territory in, in Chile. So of course I knew I was writing about others in, in the, her sense. And I also was worried about the others in this um, terrible, in this, in the most terrible thing that has happened to humanity, that was this, what, what the, what the occupation did with the, the Holocaust. We're here in the, in the, in the Holocaust and Genocide Center now. So of course I could ask her a few questions that made me know how much she knew of what was going on, how much she was a victim in general of what was happening to the Jewish community, to the uh, Polish community and so. So of course, out of that, the rest was my general research on the information of other cases, no? Or how, and how I put that together in the parts, she was silent. So let's say, I don't know at what moment she decided to come with my grandfather, but I know she started the war. She was, it, it, with, she had an, another boyfriend, a younger one, who was a very, who was a fighting for, for the resistance, no? So of course I, I make a decision of how the episodes gather together, but the episodes do exist, no? Uh, that's, that's more or less how it goes. And, um, and as she appears, let's say, in Austria in a certain date, or as I have a marvelous uh, letter that I remember I showed you, the letter that my grandfather sent her, you know, like telling her, go live to your, to your go to with your family, you know, I have to, uh, we have to run away in this situation, but if you can come with me, Great, if you can't, please go this other, situ this other way. And I don't know, like finding out how there was love too, it was, it was great too. And, uh, and yes, I did, I did use her, if that's the word, as a character, uh, in another sense, in a way to go to Poland and to do all this research. And I say that in the first uh, part of the book, because as she was an old woman that apparently was very ill and not very conscious of what was going on in her neighborhood, it was 
quite fast that other neighbors were trying to get the house or to take advantage from her or so. And so I denounced that with name and with surname. I mean, I, I hope nobody puts me on trial for this, but they're all the first part of the novel tells the real people who were around. So I say when I'm traveling to Poland for the first time as a poet and talking about this research in a university, I say, I mean, what's the difference? I'm, I'm another guy taking advantage of this woman. What do I know about Poland? What do I know about the Second World War? What do I know about um, so many things that I was talking about there because I wanted to do this research or because I was a poet invited? So I wanted to include in that part, I wanted the reader to go together with me. So if there's a kind of superficial approach in the beginning, I wanted to denounce it, no? To put myself, because now I can see that I was using her too in another sense, no? And I guess that has to, to do with becoming older. I think I was too young when I started this. And I think I just became, <laughs> most people become adults at 18 years old. I became an adult around 35 or so when I was writing this. And at, the, and at the very moment I gave in, I handed in the final version of what became the audiobook that is around there in, 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 in Spanish. It was the very day I knew, I, we got to know that, we, that my uh, fiance was pregnant of our child. So it just made perfect sense. When I was writing this, I, I, it was the first time I ever thought uh, somehow in another moment at the present, no? I think how, how many years how can one live only thinking on the presence, on the present, no? Present tense. And I started thinking so much on the past, on the identity, on who I was, that when I was writing it, I thought, okay, it, at any moment it will happen that this will follow forward, no? Because also the, the story, this novel is, I noticed while I was writing it, that it was also the story of the disappearance of a family. My father is an only son. Me and my brother are the only ones. My, my brother doesn't have uh, children. My grandfather had only one brother and his son died. And all the stories in the, it's in the book. So basically I would say that the main character is Christina, but I think as you were in a way coming to that point, I think the main character is the silence. So I guess the new title is more logical with it about ourselves, we will remain silence, silent. And because it also has to do with the, with the, with the winter side too, and with every, all of them that disappeared, there's nobody left, just one uh, faraway cousin in Hamburg, that by the way, we got to find, with, thanks to the Silk Foundation, we can talk about that too. But I mean, now, I mean, to come back that we started with a video because this is part of the family story and part of the silence. And that is such, the, I mean, a beautiful image for that a person that disappears and nobody knows where it is. And then this rope, this skipping and trying and trying, but there is nothing because you don't have the language to do so. And there is this beauty in this trying to find where do I belong and where are my roots? And to your grandmother and your father were the only ones you could talk about it. And how did they react when you looked into this? When did you actually realize all the tragedy that was behind that? Yeah, the, the, yeah first was of course my grandmother, but, but then it was mainly my father. And, and I think it was helpful for this that my father is such a strange person. If he had been like a more, more normal person, I think he would be totally against this, you know? About, I mean, this is private, why should it become public? If he had, let's say, friends like everybody else or colleagues or whoever. My father is somebody who decided to have an early retirement, who doesn't have any friends, who doesn't have any family. So he, was, he basically had nothing to lose. So at the beginning, he was a bit, uh, felt it a bit awkward, but after a while he could tell, and I'm so glad he felt like that, that I was giving him a present. I was even giving him a past. He didn't have any past. And it was his decision, but it's a decision that is not, that is supposed to be conscious, but it's just the opposite. I, I'm sure in South Africa is something very similar. He was born out of the trauma, no? out of the trauma of his own parents. He had his own trauma with the military coup. 
So when he, just exactly after the military coup, when he meets my, my mother, a Chilean person who's been Chilean for many generations, a native Chilean, let's say, or native Spanish and Chilean, a, he says, okay, we start here from nothing. We start tabula rasa, no? like out of nothing. We don't have a past. We are only, Jaco, so good to see you. I just saw Jaco up here there. <laughs> so we start just from, from nothing. When he decides that, believing that gesture to be political, I think it had exactly the opposite sign of the political of what he was thinking. It's exactly what the military dictatorship was uh, proposing. The country is being refunded. We start from nothing. We don't have a history. This is the country out of our um, points. So, and then I, he put me in a, in a private school that was the first, the same one that he went to as though there was no oppression, no dictatorship. So when I start researching this and seeing who we are, we are really opposing to that idea, opposing to the idea that history is over. No? We are what you wanted to cover to silence. No? To silence. So he was very um, active with that. And after a while, he started sending me WhatsApps, like telling me, hey, yeah, remember that page when I told you whatever, no? <laughs> like that I was sitting with Juan, you know, it was with Pedro and Pedro said this or that. He was really worried about the precision of the novel and that was wonderful. That was very generous on his side. And um, I think it's not over. I think when I started, finish, when I finished writing this, it, the novel had a bit of defending him, him. I tried to defend him, I love him, of course, of the situation of, of who, who's this monster that allowed his mother to be in these um, conditions at the beginning of the novel. No? But you know, now that I'm a father and I noticed, and I was expecting him and my mother to be very present, helping us and being very present with my son, and they're not, they have the excuse of Corona, of course, but, now I'm noticing new things that after all the research I didn't find. It was very funny, I must admit. One believes to be very smart and it's not, you know? Like I remember the moment my uh, fiance telling her therapist about this situation, no? about, our, uh, uh, about our, us, um, uh, uh, the, the delusion no? of, of my parents not being that present. And she tells them, yeah, my, my father-in-law, it's a very nice guy who's always telling us how much he loves us and he's very happy with us and he's so supportive and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, he's never present. I mean, he always, he just says all this, you know, but he doesn't act, he, he's not here in the, and the therapist says, yeah, but girl, this is, this, you can find it in any, in any book about psychology. This is a narcissist. Like the definition of a narcissist is somebody who's all the time supposed to be very into the others, but it's not at all into others, you know? So, and I wonder, and I was like, what? yes, this is like the main thing about the family issues in the novel, about our narcissistic uh, components, no? Everybody was like very nice and decent to everybody else, but everybody's totally in, the, in their own worlds without the social ties that oblige you to certain conducts, you know? In, 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 lat in the Latin culture, you're much more worried about others. It's part of our social uh, laws, no? And this gives me a lot of um, elements to, to show in the novel, not to judge. I don't feel I'm any better than that, but I feel I'm being late to notice all this stuff. So yes, the reaction from my father was the most positive that could be. And from my grandmother, she, she didn't really understand what I was doing and it wasn't my fault. I really tried hard to make her know that I was writing about her life, but I had really nice moments showing her pictures of the trip or stuff like that. And she could recognize the places and she could get into this old uh, love stories. I think with her, it was mainly positive. And would you say in your fam within your family before we start to read the one because uh, Enrique it's now only in Spanish the novel but Enrique translated one page into the beginning into English and I find it 
wonderful that we can hear this afterwards. But I just want to ask quickly before, do you think there is some healing also for because your family, these people that are in their own worlds, is there a healing or a togetherness coming out of this novel and this research? Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, but it's a complex one because I think when I started this, I felt, I felt it didn't make any sense not to know anything who one is, no? Like, to, don't to know anything about one's identity. But after all this research, after all these huge depths, I understand why you shouldn't know all, why you should, because it's a huge uh, burden after a while and like a huge excuse. I think, I think nature, Autopoiesis, no? This idea that one that nature makes life continue in a in a complex mix of conservating something about being yourself, your identity, and adapting to what you what you're not. So it's 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 even more beautiful than healing, I think, because it's healing, but also accepting the fluidity of who you're not anymore. Um, and the uh, and for me, that was good. I think I'm in a in a more similar moment to the beginning than I thought, you know. And I think I I'm more critical with the people around me, but also more accepting, and with myself too. So I think I think it's a complex healing. It's a it's it's a better one in a sense. No, it's a healing that doesn't have that has to do more with pardon. Let's say with with. Uh, Pardon is the word, no? like to, uh, to pardon oneself and to pardon the people around you. And, uh, and to also know yourself. And finally, to think some things are not that important in a sense, you know? I, and, and that also puts me in a position of, perhaps I just came to this world to do this, you know? And the rest is just literature, no matter how much importance I think it has, you know? <laughs> like what I write, but this, but this had to do this I would have done even if I wasn't a writer. That would be the answer, no? Mm. This was like what I had to do for my people. And I think everybody has to do something for his or her, her people. Yeah. Would you like to share? Okay, good. Uh, what I could share, let's say, is that perhaps, yeah, I will read the very beginning of the novel in this a bit of a quick translation. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit of a more serious translator in general, but this was done, done again in a hurry. But I will start with the poem, Polish Woman, that was translated by Richard Wynne, a um, Welsh poet for a Latin American anthology he did. So you can tell a bit of what I knew 15 years ago. And then I'll read the first page that is the very moment that from when I started writing it, no? because of what happened. Yeah, I think that could be a, a good idea. Okay. Um, I wonder if in the recording I have appeared because I was, uh, I'm sorry to tell that I was uh, distressed by my so face, but now that I'm going to be reading, you can so put my face again if you want. There's no problem. So the, the poem <laughs> is the one that I, don't, I think we have, um, the poem, we have only the text. Do we? No worries. I, I, I'll, I'll read the poem and you can watch me reading as I'm not but watching you. But you read, but you, you do it in Spanish or in English? No, in English, of course. In English, okay, of course. And, and the one that we have, is it in, in, it's in English? It's in English. So there must be, but... Oh, uh, no, but I sent you, as, a, as I allowed you to, for changes, I sent you the word. Uh, I know, that, I think it disappeared. No I'm so sorry. No, so no, then no we have it in Spanish and maybe you tell afterwards. No, let's, do, let's do like this. I'm going to read these two pieces. And then if you want, we go through these uh, um, images I sent you to show, to show Christina and to show some documents, part of the research. Okay. Fabulous. So them. Thank you. Polish woman. From a questionably noble background, like all noble backgrounds, her father Amotzelewska, her mother Wierzykowska, an orphan at 15, 1939, she asks for work in the occupied state industry. The boss, close to 40, they flee together to Vienna because of the Russians. Due to Miller's jealousy, she falls prisoner, accused by the Nazis so as to marry her sister. The months are more than three. 
the Yanks liberate her. She walks for days to Salzburg, and in the square, as a siren blares, she sees her boss running. Papa, she yells. They marry in secret, so he'll never kiss her on the mouth. A housekeeper to her brother-in-law, she sleeps in the servant's room, just as in Chile, where she brought Goethe and a few old clothes to turn the fishing boat into one with a captain and sailors, a son, widow, cats, dogs, birds, the smell like her or, or vice versa. You aren't even there for your grandchildren, complains my father. I ring the bell and it makes no sound. Shout and she doesn't answer. Six fat and furious dogs bark from over the railing. That's the poem. And um, oh, I opened by mistake uh, a document and I should say it for, before I forget it. I, just as Veronica Phillips is present with us in this, this, in this event, I want, her, I want her to include Kristina Mozelewska, uh, the main character when we planned this event. She was alive and she passed away a month ago um, with 96 years old and she was 96 years old and seven months. So of course I dedicate her, I dedicate this event to her too. So I will read the beginning of the, of the novel. The novel would be some, the title would be something like, we will keep quiet about ourselves. Time in its numberless span births things unseen to the light and conceals them again at the end. Ajax, Sophocles. The first section is called, what can I know? Each of the sections has one of these four questions from Kant, what can I know? A, the process. Someone had done Christina's makeup. She was waiting for us with her hair done standing on the sidewalk on the 26th of August, 2008. As I approached, I smelled a sweet perfume instead of the garlic that she nibbled every now and then, enumerating its virtues. Her hair, submerged for decades in vinegar, now shone on the polka dots of her dress. I knew it. Perhaps it was the only one on her rack and someone, besides bathing her, had walked quietly among six fat and furious dogs to the second floor to unhook it. How can you think of it, Enrique? I didn't file a complaint. I have nothing to do with this matter. Cristina turned her back to him and leaning on the car, she told me as if it came to the story, this one didn't want to get out of me. He was stubborn. He broke and I was skinny, only a belly. You have a better memory because my ear doesn't work well. 84 years old, they told me, when did you clean your ear? Never, it's kilo fat inside each ear. I held her up and she scrutinized me up and down. So elegant in your suit, mijito. Girls might well piss on their skirts for you. From the back seat, dazzled by the zebra sun at every turn of the car, I put my hands on hers. Pour some cream on them. They are very dry, like a log. You're going to say that he brings you money, I insisted. Yes, mijito, and he loves me very much. I love him very much too. Enrique raised an eyebrow in the rear view mirror. The night he had told me about the complaint, I imagined his white helmet on the seat where I was sitting now, with him on his back, in his way back from going up and down buildings like every day for the last 30 years, whistling Girl by the Beatles, the one about breaking his back to end his day of leisure. Sure enough, he unfolded the complaint in front of the janitor and Christina's full name reminded him of the stakes she had defrosted for him 50 years earlier. It was late as it was then when he, he underlined the claim, toasted whole with breads and ate them in bed, absent-mindedly watching the news, all that he told me. After the weather forecast, he called me and the next morning I received by email the sour descriptions that five days later I was digesting in his car by Christina's moistened hand. I'm very sorry for, my English is getting a bit rusty after so many years uh, between Spanish and, and, and German, but I guess some things could more or less be understood in this conversation. So if you want, Indra, I can, we can, you can show these uh, images I sent you and we can talk a bit about them. Yeah, that we can do.
Okay, so the, the first one, sorry, the last one in your case, the number five. What you're seeing here is a wedding register, it's a register of the wedding of my great, 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 great grandparents, uh, 1820. Uh, so I, these are the older documents I had. So I know from people who were born in 1813 and the names of their parents. So I went all the way back in the fourth section to 1793. That was the moment in which uh, the Germans and the Russians uh, divided Poland uh, among their own, uh, in, well, the Prussians and the Russians divided the territory. So this was still written in Polish, but they have some documents written in Russian later. So this, uh, this kind of documents I worked for the 19th century and in picture number four, uh, Ingra, please. You can see the same document um, from 1946. That was the wedding uh, register of my own grandparents. The, the yellow one, please. Um, do, because I'm not doing this. Okay, the number four, number no. four. No, one before that. This one. Oh, oh, sorry, I sent, I sent the Chilean one, sorry. This is not as nice as the other one, <laughs> but it's fine. Just, you can see how this uh, started moving, no? The same documents started, had to exist in Chile. No worries. So let's go to the pictures that I think is the nicer thing. The pictures you copied here. This is Cristina, my grandmother, and this is Enrique my father. These are the characters of the first page I just read to you. This is in Algarrobo, a beach in the center of Chile. It's about an hour away from where I am. That is, by the way, the port where my grandparents came to Chile. I came to visit, to sorry, to live in the city without even knowing this. So these things happen, no? I'm living where they first came to Chile. So this picture must have, might have been around 1957, according to my uh, research. Um, I sent more pictures to you, but no worries if these are the ones that appear. Well, this is 2008, January 2008. As you can tell, uh, hair has been leaving me behind. <laughs> I, I, I cut it before it was too late. Uh, and this was the day I made my oath as a lawyer. So I think this is the last very, very nice picture with, with her. Um, beginning of 2008, so she was 83. Well, this is the moment, this is the very year the novel starts. So this shows her at the moment when she was having this hoarding problem, but when she left her house, she was uh, 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 this lovely woman you see here in the picture. And I was this young person full of ideals to, in the lawyer scene. <laughs> I guess that's it, that's it, no? So if you want, ah, and this document, it's, well, um, I think I will include in the novel immediately after what I just read, because it shows them the names, it makes things clear of who is who. And it says intrafamily violence, what is of course, super violent itself, no? Um, funny enough, I must admit that in the novel that, is, that the editors have, I had given another document instead of this one. And today I found out that I did have the one that gives this very first impression of the, of the Chilean state, considering uh, that my father was a perpetrator of a situation of violence, what is of course terrible, no? And that's pretty much what um, made me start um, researching who we were. How did we came to this terrible situation 60 years later than they, that the moment they arrived to Chile? As Polish, Polish citizens, all of them. Yes, those are all the documents I had. No, no worries. That's perfect. That's perfect. I think that's that's enough. I, I'm very, I'm looking forward to see what the the people here think. What do you want to ask, or what do you want to share with us? How how our situations uh, resemble or not? 
Uh, maybe that's a good time to ask the audience for questions uh, and, 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 and share information as well. I know that writers are among that are very fine memoir and, and, and writers. So maybe there is a wonderful conversation here. So maybe um, do if you can remove the spotlights and maybe we can open the gallery of everyone and we can have a conversation. So if everyone can just put on gallery view uh, and then we can, uh, we can have a, a, a conversation. Thank you. Enrique, just if, if, I can, uh, if I can start, I'm, I'm actually quite amazed that I did not know that Christina came from Novi Dvor. In December, we did a whole hour and a half about the town of Novi Dvor. No way. And I want to have your email and share with you some of those amazing history that is connected also to South African Jewish community and new memorials that are happening in Novi Dvor now, new education that is happening in schools now in Novi Dvor. And I think that I would very much like to connect you to people that are doing amazing work about memory of, uh, of the Second World War and uh, of Novi Dvor and the Holocaust at the moment in well, Poland. Please, please do so. I, can, I, I know everything is connected. There's a novel similar to mine that is called Everything is Illuminated. And I think it's like this. I know that when, when this dialogue start, you, one has to always say, yes, these things start opening and opening. Like we didn't have the time to talk about that, but other coincidences like this have happened to me. I've been a writer out of this poem I just read, a, a young person from Poland wrote to me and he happened to be like a descendant from my, own, from the, from my great uh, grandparents' brother too. And we started putting all the pieces together Novidvur, for the rest of the audience, is such a small town. Of course, I went there many times, and it's it's tiny, tiny. Imagine my grandmother lived in Paderesquiego two. I mean, it's the number two, so it's the very beginning of the main street. That is the only main street, and the, where the train station is. So, no, impressive. I I look, I researched a lot, and there was not much to find there. Uh, my great grandfather worked in the modeling uh, fortress that is just around there. He was a Polish. Yes, uh, I know uh, it. <laughs> a, a, a marine, no? And oh, no, we have to talk about this. And of course, the example I said about my grandmother's mother is that she was very probably uh, shot there, no? In Novidvor itself, where, they, where the registers were destroyed by the Nazi occupation. Um, yeah. Is, yeah, so we, we, we are go I'm going to, to, to tell you and connect you. Uh, and even I have a, a personal uh, connection to Novi Dvor through, through a cousin. So no, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, so so um, Indra, would you manage, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, perhaps ask a question or maybe even just reflect or comment, I think. Uh, but Indra, I don't know if you want to maybe manage that or... Shall we just open the floor and whoever wants to um, to start? I think we should just open the floor because I, there are not many pictures and, and images, so I don't know who wants to say something. And whoever wants, please feel free to say something. People will be a bit shy, but maybe someone will be less shy. <laughs> Perhaps if people don't mind, they could show their videos. Thank you. I can tell you, meanwhile, that um, I brought, after being there twice, in 2017, I brought my father to Novi Dvor. So I showed him the city where his mother was born. He didn't even know the name of the place. It's incredible how we could be raised without even knowing where my grandmother was born. Like, and it was as easy as asking her what I did. And, and, and when she told me Novidvur, of course I asked her to, to spell it for me and stuff. And well, 
That was the beginning. Of course, there is a city council where I could find more information. There's a donor kebab, a, a restaurant where she was in, at her house now. <laughs> what also shows you about the fluidity of our identities, no? I'm very embarrassed the owner, the guy who was working at the restaurant felt very shy. He felt I was going to try to throw him out and get the house again for me. So I really tried hard to convince him that I was just in a literary research, not in a, not trying to recover any house or anything. Yeah, that was actually because I was with, and that was actually very interesting because I did some research at the same time about how Poland changed to the peace party and how actually this, for me, it's so, it was so, so interesting to look how a country that had so many different people before became such a monolith and one cultural place. And then there were these people in the kebab shop and how badly they speak about foreigners. And that one was somebody who studied design in, in Milan and come, came from Bangladesh. And now he opened this. And that was actually a very nice kebab shop, you know? And so, and then I thought, yeah, this is the world can be so diverse and beautiful. And there are so many people around that don't want this. And this is so sad at the same time. Yeah, and we are told that I must admit that was pretty much what I, a thought before, you know, like in, in my ignorance, we are all this, this nation a idea, nation state idea is contemporary, is completely modern, you know, it, it's first world war, you know, like before that, like, well, what, what this kebab example is pretty much how we've all lived for thousands of years, you know, and you don't have to go that far away. I was surprised with my 19th century uh, research in, in Poland, you know, and as I went to the small towns where all these uh, greater grandparents came from, uh, all of them still had the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the synagogues and they also had the Lutheran churches. I mean, there was no population that went to them, but they still had them, you know, and you could tell in the few streets how relevant all these other communities were and they're not there anymore. And you cannot cover this story with with cover the sun with one finger, we say, no? So here's a question I see. Gideon yeah. Mendel asks me, how has this research affected your personal sense of historical identity? Thank you very much, Gideon, for the, for the question. Um, yeah, it has affected me a lot in different senses. I have felt the Polish and German side have become like urgent to discover and, uh, and in a part of a coincidence, but who knows if any of these things are coincidences. My, um, my fiance, she's German from Argentinian origin. So she's pretty much the opposite history, you know? She came from Latin America and went to Europe out of the political issues in Latin America. So it's pretty much what my story would have could have been. So our, our son is German and Chilean, but of course his identity has much more to do with all the Russians that are in my grandfather and grand on my fiance's side, etc. So pretty much made me a much more um, suspicious of this global culture that is pretty much the US one, especially if we come from the from the South, no? Like in Chile, like even thinking of what music I hear, what, the, what books I write, I read, etc. Like it has made me, it has been part of a bigger process of learning feminism and, 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 ecolo and ecologism and other things that are so crucial today. So it has like a big scope, but in the smaller scope, it has made me um, um, more uh, tolerant with things in my own personality that I can that I can now map where do they come from, you know? To be honest, the first time I was in Poland, after being in countries very different to mine, like let's say Japan, for example, or Myanmar uh, later, I've never feel, felt more a foreigner in my life than being in Poland, for example. And I know that's a sensation out of many Jewish friends, I know that's a sensation of many people who descend from Polish Jewish, but when they go back to Poland, they say, I have nothing to do with this place. So, so I've been thinking of 
that problem, no? Entering a lot into their own music, into their own literature, into their own history, and seeing what of that is I can trace in me, trace in my grandmother. Tracing, finally, I think the research has to do with, with the moment you get conscious that what is supposed to be normal, because it is your family, is the people you share with, is not necessarily normal, and, and what's normal, by the way. So, so in my case, it came to embrace parts of my way of uh, relating to others that were not those that my mother taught me, you know, that my Chilean mother taught me, that, that since I was very much a kid, like in a Latin caricature, caricature would, would tell me how should I be to have a lot of friends and to be very social and whatever, you know, <laughs> and to be this person who smiles all the time or whatever. And I started embracing other parts of my own personality. If, if, if your um, question went in that way, please tell me if it's not and I should answer you in, a, in another sense. Um, but yeah, that on my identity. On the historical identity, I think it's very, very crucial in nowadays in which dialogue is being diminished by the sensation of being in the correct side of history. It's a problem worldwide that half the population thinks one thing and the other half thinks the opposite and we just can't dialogue anymore. With these situations, I think it makes me very conscious of trying to embrace a dialogue, especially in turmoils like the one I'm living now in Chile. I write um, uh, columns in the, in the media that are, that are very uh, active in activist in a way, but I always try to tend uh, uh, bridges. I'm writing to the opposite side. I'm not writing to the people who think the same that I, that I do think. And I think one, when one starts knowing part of its own, his own family history, it obliges you to that because obviously you have the contradiction in yourself. You don't have to search very far away from yourself to see that this dialogue is necessary and urgent. Okay, thanks Enrique. If there is no other question, maybe we show the video. I mean, the last poem of yours, maybe. What do you okay. think? Okay, this is a this is a video that I, I also, these are the only two that were translated into English. So that's why we chose. And I think it's also a, a nice way of ending the, 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 my part of the event. Of course, it's open for new questions if you want, but what we offered, because it's pretty much a poem of love to my father and it was before all this research was done. He's um, an engineer, he works in construction. Uh, well, and the rest, I think the video will talk for it. This was a project we did with some musicians um, eight years ago. caja de zapatos donde vivo, la caja de zapatos donde vive mi padre, dos zapatos izquierdos. Cuando chica quería ser artista, veterinaria o astronauta. Yo arquitecto, me mira y no me cree. Mi papá me llevó a la construcción algunos sábados, a mí me encantaba. Una vez le pregunté en qué consistía su trabajo. Me dijo que el arquitecto, primera vez que oía esa palabra y me sonó importante de inmediato, como archiduque, imaginaba el edificio y que la pega de él consistía en que simplemente no se cayera. Un trabajo que solo imaginaba lugares me pareció extraordinario, no así la opaca labor del padre. Los lugares imaginados se le comunicaban con dibujos y a eso dediqué mi infancia, a dibujarle rascacielos y chozas. La pega de mi papá consiste en que no se caiga.
Yeah, thank you so much, Enrique, for sharing. And we are looking forward to the English translation. And then we maybe can do another talk. Um, yeah, and our next um, of our Voices of Belonging and Resistance, our next event will be on the 25th of April with the uh, Burmese poet Dilou Galay. Enrique knows him too, and hopefully he will join, be able to join, because the situation in Myanmar is terrible right now, and we just hope it will get better. So thanks all for joining, and Tali, thanks again for hosting us. Thank you very much to, to all of you. It's, it's a great pleasure for me. Please send me the information on Novibur, on what you did, and uh, I hope it made sense. Uh, what I pre presented today. So a uh, big hug to all of you and keep safe. Thank you so much, Enrique and Indra, and good night to everyone. We will see you again soon. Enrique, we will be in touch for sure. <laughs> Thank good you. Good night. Good night.